Okay, today we're going to begin our look at the second major section of the science of logic, which Hegel identifies as the logic of essence. He admits that this is, in a way, uh, the most difficult section, and it presents a very daunting challenge. You're immediately hit with a blizzard of terms, a proliferation of negations, for example, and uh, you know, it risks leaving you bewildered, to say the least. Um, what I want to do today is to, is to try to uh, identify the different stages in the argument of the opening section of the logic of essence. And I hope the discussion will clarify what these different terms signify, what these different determinations of essence signify, and why they're presented in the order in which they're given. Now, to begin with, I pointed out that uh, in many respects, the determinations or categories that are treated in the logic of essence have tended to be privileged by modern philosophy. And I think you can see this in two respects. As, as I suggested, one can think of the different parts of the science of logic as respectively treating in the logic of being determinacy, without further qualification, uh, in which the terms in question that involve qualitative, quantitative, and measure specifications all have their character in reference to other terms that all are operating on the same level. They stand in relation to one another. They, as Hegel puts it, pass over into further determinations. But this is always done in terms of uh, specifications that could be said to be equiprimordial. That is, none has any primacy over the others. By contrast, in the logic of essence, we're dealing with a domain that could be said to always involve two tiers or two different levels, where one level has primacy over the other, where we're dealing with, on the one hand, determinations that are determined by something else, and that something else, which in some respect is primary, is a determiner of those other factors. And we'll be looking at this as it operates in its perhaps most minimal way, in the relationship of essence to, well, first of all, the essential and the unessential, essence and show, shine in German, or illusory being, as our uh, translator puts it. And then later on, we'll have essence and appearance, we'll have the thing and its properties, we'll have cause and effect, and a variety of other specifications, all of which involve what could be spoken of in general as a domain of determined determinacy, which involves a determiner of determined determinacy. Or, to use a language that Hegel employs from the very outset, here, what is determinate is posited. Posited by something else, which figures as a positive <coughs> In contrast, the logic of the so-called concept is going to turn out to be a logic of self-determination, where what is determined is not distinguishable from what does the determining. As I mentioned earlier, you can see how there's a kind of, um, well, rationale behind the kind of succession. If you want to operate in a way where you're not taking for granted the terms you need to specify the subject matter, the logic of being, if it presents Determinacy, from starting with no determinacy, uh, provides the basic material that any talk of determined determinacy has to involve, because determined determinacy involves <coughs> determinacy. But it adds something more. It adds a determinacy that has a primacy over other determinacies, a determinacy that is a determiner, that operates upon other factors that are now determined determinacies not determined by contrast with an equiprimordial other in terms of something other, but now we have something that mediates the other term, 
without being mediated by it in the same manner. By contrast, if we're going to talk about self-determination, it requires determiner and determined, but now the determiner has turned out to be just as much determined. The determined operates as being just as much determiner. Well, that in a way is a um, thumbnail sketch of how one might think of how the subject matter ends up dividing itself. Um, in speaking about why the categories of determined determinacy or the logic of essence have such a preeminent role in modern philosophy, it reflects two things. The pervasive acceptance of what I, I called earlier foundationalism. That is the notion that one regards everything that can count as true or right or beautiful, anything that is normative, as owing its normativity or its validity to some factor that is the foundation of its validity, where there is some privileged factor that confers validity upon that which is valid. And that is broadly accepted as the character of rationality. Accepting that as the framework of rationality may lead one to follow Nietzsche and regard rationality as an imposter, as being something that ends up being a will to power because of the problems that this way of construing rationality or justification or validity um, operates. And I'll say something about that in, in a minute. Um, I mean, the, the basic problem that one could point to is that if you draw this distinction where what counts <coughs> as what is is regarded as being founded upon something else, or one regards what is valid as owing its validity to some other factor, that privileged factor or foundation can only meet its own standard for what counts as valid if it ends up being determined by itself. In other words, the factor that confers validity on other things can only have validity of its own if it somehow rests upon itself or grounds itself. But in doing that, the difference between what is founded and what operates as the foundation is removed. That very distinction, which might be said to be the distinction characterizing a logic of essence, ends up collapsing when one calls into account the legitimacy of the privileged factor that is supposed to determine what rests upon it. Now, the, the appeal to foundations or the idea that what is noble or what is right or what is beautiful rests upon something that mediates it in a way reflects this, gen, this sort of commonplace uh, attitude that confronts what is given as something that is just not to be accepted as it's immediately given. But one presumes that there must be something underlying it that makes it what it is, that allows us to account for it. And this is a kind of reflection upon the given that wants to treat being as being something that rests upon something that is not immediately given, something that is the source or foundation or undisclosed ground of what is given, which means that we're going to treat the given not as just being immediate, but as being mediated by something else. And only then are we going to really understand what truly is. Now, the expression of, of this, this approach uh, is sort of encapsulated in a principle that Leibniz provides as something he considers quite basic, and that's the principle of sufficient reason. Right? The principle of sufficient reason uh, basically states that everything, everything that is, must have a reason sufficient for it being what it is. Now, that appeal to a reason or a sufficient reason is an appeal to something different from what is. That is, everything, if it 
has to have a sufficient reason. Everything that is is going to be something that could be said to have a ground. Or what is is understood to be grounded. Or what is is understood to be conditioned. Kant makes this a principle that holds true of what we can know, which as far as Kant is concerned is limited to what we can uh, experience if we're talking about knowledge that is objective. And this reflects something that I think we can associate with a, a distinctly modern turn of philosophy, a turn away from beginning philosophy with a conceptualization of what is, doing ontology as first philosophy, to a turn to investigate knowing as something we first have to authenticate before we can make valid claims about what is. As I've suggested earlier, if you take that strategy, it only makes sense if you construe knowing as being determinative of what can be known. Because only if you consider knowing to be, shall we say, the ground or the determiner of what is knowable, can an investigation of knowing have any possible um, relevance to determining what knowing can know? Because if knowing does not determine the object of knowing, the only way you can, can, shall we say, certify the validity of knowledge claims is by appealing to what is, independently of knowing. But the turn to investigate knowing as something that must supplant ontology is based upon the recognition that we can't just begin reading off the character of what is because we're taking for granted the authority of our, our, our reading it off. But that means we're not in a position to evaluate our knowledge claims by pointing to what is and seeing if it corresponds. So the whole move of so-called transcendental philosophy ends up treating what is knowable as being determined by the structure of knowing. And it's no accident that the domain of what is knowable is a domain of what is determined by something else, what is mediated by something else, what is conditioned or grounded. And as those of you know who have read Kant, Kant will consider all knowable phenomena as on the first instance being conditioned, being conditioned and subject to an external necessity. Moreover, as being phenomena, because in a way they are merely posits of our knowing. And because of that, they have a kind of subjective character. They are relative to our knowing. We are not in a position to know things in themselves. We can only know appearances. <coughs> and hence, what is knowable is to be understood in terms of the categories of appearance, of what is, of what is uh, conditioned. The categories, that in a sense, are the categories that, as we shall see, fall within the logic of essence. These are taken to be definitive of, shall we say, what is objective, what is knowable to be, or what we can know to be. And our investigation, in a sense, will be both examining these categories, which in a certain sense, as Hegel will remind us over and over again, have never really been considered in their own right by the likes of Kant. He just applies them within the framework of his analysis of knowing. He doesn't investigate what they are in and of themselves, or whether he's uh, presenting an exhaustive account or uh, a non-arbitrary account of what they are. Um, so in a sense, we're going to be looking at a kind of critical reconstruction of these categories, but also one which will show that on the one hand, they are not, they are not non-derivative. They themselves emerge from the logic of being. And moreover, they are not going to be ultimate because they themselves are going to give way through their very own workings to determinations of a different character, determinations that are what is self-determined. I might also say in that regard that if you accept these notions as being definitive and exhaustive of what is knowable, as much modern philosophy does, that excludes from objectivity anything that is self-determined. 
And that involves not only knowing the knower, who Kant will admit has exhibits spontaneity, and who is a moral subject is, is supposed to be autonomous, but it's also going to, to sort of leave out of, of objectivity life, which has something about it that has a kind of self-moving character. Uh, yeah, did you? Is there, um, is, is it necessary, um, as Leibniz has it, that anything that exists um, must have some kind of, um, must be preceded by any kind of uh, necessary condition. So, I mean, of course, the cliche uh, existence precedes essence. Is it necessary that it should be otherwise? You're saying is it necessary that it that it should be As otherwise than describes that that, yeah. that for anything to exist or to yeah. be that it must have some uh, the reason for its own being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of as a. Yeah. in the process of conceiving this before yeah. the fact. Yeah. Uh, is, it ne is it necessary that it shouldn't be opposite? That, that it shouldn't be opposite what it is, are you saying? Yeah, that yeah. things exist. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss aspects of this later on because they'll become pertinent with certain other categories that do fall within the logic of essence. But, uh, you know, Leibniz will speak of possible worlds. And to speak of possible worlds is to indicate that worlds, as possible in a sense, are conditioned. Because what is possible becomes actual insofar as something is supplied to make it not just a possibility, but something actual. It, it can't, it's not, it's not self actualizing, it's conditioned by something. It's contingent, one might say. And for Leibniz, it's contingent, well, it's contingent on what? That, in a sense, reflects a certain theological tradition. Calls, naturalistic calls, I guess. Well, not naturalistic, a supernaturalistic cause, you might say. Because we're talking about the world or nature as a whole being possible. It issues from what? The will of God. Right? And the will of God, in a sense, as free, uh, might be thought of as not being bound to any particular world. So that, in a certain sense, that signifies that, although one might have the view, and may find aspects of this in Leibniz, that um, God's intellect specifies the possibilities of worlds that there can be. It's God's will that determines which of the possible worlds will be. And if, therefore, if we want to know what is the character of the world, we can't just rely upon reason. Reason might be able to tell us, in a sense, the contents of God's intellect, which specify the, the fundamental options of what's possible. But insofar as what the world is is conditioned and grounded on something outside the world, uh, which is the only way you can talk about there being such a thing as possible worlds, um, we have to observe the world and see what God has created. Now Leibniz undercuts this, this kind of voluntary character by also claiming that God, as perfect, cannot help but will that which is most perfect, or the best of all possible worlds. Well, if God, as perfect, can't help but will the best of all possible worlds, there really aren't a plurality of possible worlds. There's only one world that's possible, the best of all. The best world. Can't even speak of any of all possible worlds. Note that all this talk of, of I mean, there's a lot of talk in contemporary analytic philosophy of possible worlds. And it's based upon uh, the problem that a certain strain of analytic thought has where it, 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 it wants to regard what can be meaningfully referred to as what, in a sense, can be an object of our experience. Everything else is sort of nonsense. But clearly, we can talk about things that are fictional, for example, things that ought to be that are not realized. So to deal with that, you have people, a guy named Lewis, who speak of doing so in terms of possible worlds. 
But note, to speak of possible worlds means you have to consider the world as being conditioned or grounded on something outside the world, which ultimately requires that you embrace, whether you like it or not, some kind of theological assumption or something, shall we say, extraworldly that is the basis for the world. Now, with regard to the logic of essence, um, in my discussion, I, I, I sort of give you an overview of what Hegel presents as the way in which determinacy comes to render itself mediated by something that does nothing other than mediate it and has no other character than being the mediator of the totality of the determinations of being. The details of that involve what happens when we have those specifications of determinacy that incorporate both quality and quantity in measure relations, and how measure relations undergo, in virtue of what they are, a kind of infinite regress of sorts, where each measure determination, where a certain quality is connected to, to quantity, ends up having a beyond. And that beyond, on the one hand, could be regarded as what is not measured, what is the measureless. And each measure points to that, because each measure, in a sense, has a quality connected to quantity, but quantity has a certain kind of continuity. It, it automatically leads seamlessly beyond itself, as numbers seamlessly enter into a kind of quantitative infinite. infinite. Well, if you're going to speak about what lies beyond a measure, on the one hand, it's what is not a measure. It's measureless. But what, is, what lies beyond a measure can't help but be another measure. Because what lies beyond a measure is when a certain quantitative range has been breached, where the quality that's connected to it is, is, is no longer uh, sustainable, as when liquid water turns into ice. And that happens when you now have a new measure, a new quality associated with certain quantities. It has the same kind of limit, and there's something beyond it. And what Hegel wants to suggest is that this process that is endemic, built in to the determinations of determinacy, comprising the logic of being, it, in a sense, presents something that itself does not change. All of the determinations of quality and quantity end up getting surpassed, replaced by others. The process itself just continues to do the same thing. It's a process in which the givenness of all quantitative and qualitative specifications is superseded and removed and then resuscitated with further determinations. Each of the determinations of quantity and quality in this process end up being states of this uniform, unchanging process, which renders them no longer immediate but mediated by something that is not contained within the process, but is the process as a whole. And that sort of sets up this two-tiered situation, where we have something that is nothing other than the mediator of a domain of all specifications of determinacy that are rendered mediated by it. And this provides us with, Hegel believes, the move to a, a specification that can't remain within the logic of being. Because in the logic of being, all specifications are, shall we say, equiprimordial. They are what they are in some respect in virtue of various kinds of contrast, contrast between something and other, contrast between one and, and other ones, one of the many, contrast between quantities, contrast between measure relations, and so forth. But now we've arrived at something that has a different character. And this becomes the starting point of what he will call the logic of essence. And the question is, what do we have? You know, what are we confronting to begin with? Well, we have, in a sense, the determinations of being being, in a way, 
being, as Hegel will say, posited by something that has no other character than being that which mediates the determinations of being. The determinations of being now, be, now having become posited no longer have an immediate givenness. They are mediated by something. And that something, in a way I shouldn't even say something, that, that factor itself is nothing more than that which mediates the domain of being. Now Hegel speaks of this as being the initial specification of the logic of essence. And, and he points out that at the outset, this mediator, this positor of the determinations of being is indeterminate. It's just a positor without further qualifications. It's a positor of, of being without further qualification. And in a sense, there's something very formal about its positing. Because its positing has not generated the content of quality, quantity, measure relations, and so forth. It, is, it simply renders those specifications mediated. It deprives them of their immediate givenness. It is not itself generating further contents on its own. It's just transforming the form of immediacy that they had to a form where they are now mediated. And to, to, to make this apparent, Hegel points out how you find just this kind of move being um, adopted by the ancient skeptics. The ancient skeptics, uh, and I think if you want to um, acquaint yourself with ancient skepticism, the best place to look is the writings of Sextus Empiricus. And, uh, you know, Sextus Empiricus does not consider himself a, a skeptic in the sense of what he calls the academics, who engage in that self-defeating enterprise of claiming to know that there is nothing, to know that there is no knowledge. Because obviously, you're, you're putting your foot in your mouth if you do that, right? Because you're making a knowledge claim at the same time that you're saying that one can't know. Instead, what the skeptics do is they confront claims that people make about what is. And in making claims about what is, they're claiming that this is what is immediately at hand. And try to show that all such claims end up being uh, cast in doubt by a counterclaim that is equally justifiable. And that if you can show that there is this, this contradiction, or that there are these two opposing views that have equal weight behind them, what can you do? You can suspend judgment. Why do you suspend judgment? Well, you find, you don't know for sure that this is the case, because that would require making a knowledge claim of your own, but you find that if you do that, you have a mental tranquility. Why? Because you're not worried any longer about making a claim about what is. Instead, you treat what is as just being a phenomena. Or you might say it's just being an appearance. It's what appears to us. We don't have to worry about what appears to us. We're not going to make any truth claims about it. We're not going to claim that what appears to us really is, is immediate. No, it's just what is relative to us. It is what is mediated by our viewpoint. And that we don't have to deny or concern ourselves with. We'll just refrain from making any absolute claims about anything. So what do we do? We don't come up with new contents. We just take an attitude where what is given, what is immediately determinate, whatever it may be, is regarded by us to just be a phenomena to just be an appearance, to just be something mediated. And Hegel points out that this is also what you find being done by Kantian idealism, which wants to regard what we experience as not being what things are in themselves, 
as what is, without further qualification, but as just an appearance, as something relative to our framework of knowing, and thereby mediated by it. No, the contents are not generated by the shift. The contents are the same. That's the sense in which essence, as it first arises, is formal, because its, or its mediation is formal, or its positing of what is posited is formal. Because what it posits has a content that is given. What the positing does in the first instance is simply remove the immediacy of that content, because now, by being posited, it is mediated. Now, because, and in a way, this presence or this aspect of a certain kind of formal element of the positing is to some degree built into the whole framework that we're going to be dealing with. Because if you're talking about this relationship of a determiner and what it determines, of a positor and what is positive, even though the determiner is determining something, it's determining something different from itself. That difference is always going to be there. If you remove the difference, we're no longer talking about positing, we're talking about self-determination. So there's to some degree a difference. There's to some degree something about the positing or determining that does not exhaustively generate everything about what it is dealing with. And here we have it at the outset, and that's going to be the reason for why Hegel characterizes the debut of uh, the determinations of essence as involving a contrast of the essential and the unessential. Now, by the way, if we want to look at an overview of uh, the whole development of the logic of essence, uh, it's divided into three sections, as you probably know, uh, by looking at least in the table of contents. Uh, the first section uh, is characterized as essence is reflection in itself. This is followed by uh, what's called appearance, and then the third section is called actuality. Hegel will speak about how, in a sense, uh, we first have essence being reflected in itself, then he will speak about how essence will appear, and then thirdly, that essence will make itself manifest in the terms of actuality. We'll have to see what all of this amounts to. But in this first section, as you've seen, we, the very first section, which is, speaks about um, the very first section of the section of essence as reflection into itself, we have three successive determinations. The first one is this relationship of the essential and the unessential. Then we have what is called illusory being, the German word is shine. And then thirdly, we have reflection. And as you know, there are three forms of reflection that here enter in. Positing reflection, external reflection, and determining reflection. And what I want us to do is to try to get some sense of what all of these specifications are and why they operate in the way they do and why they follow in the way they do. Now, when Hegel speaks about the initial specification of essence as involving a relation of the essential and the unessential. He uses these terms because he wants to indicate that, in a certain sense, the way essence first comes before us is a manner in which it comes clothed in a qualitative contrast, or something involving uh, a kind of holdover of aspects of the logic of determinate being. And this has to do with the fact that here, essence has emerged from the logic of being, and in doing so, it mediates determinations that its mediation has, does not account for. They're simply there. They have something about them that has a kind of givenness. And the process of their mediation, in a sense, is something that has arisen out of what they are. They've rendered themselves mediated. Uh, the mediation, in a sense, is, kind, as Hegel will say, indifferent to them. We have the same kind of process pertaining to all of them, no matter what they are. 
So this indicates that in some respect there's <coughs> something other, there's an aspect of otherness in what essence mediates. And that aspect of otherness means that on, in a certain respect, the mediator or the positor that essence comprises stands in relationship to something that has a given character that the positing is distinct from. And that givenness is you know, all of the determinations of, of, of being a quality, quantity, and measure that are at hand. They've been rendered mediated, but that change from immediate to mediated has not generated their contents to begin with. The content is there, just in the way in which when the skeptics want to lead us to treat what we confront as not being what is, but as simply a phenomena, that move does not in any way generate the content of the phenomena. That's something given. So in this respect, there's a kind of relation of, of something and other, of two terms that confront each other. And in this respect, the essential is one term facing the unessential. But we're not in a relation of something and other, because the two terms are not equiprimordial. The mediator or positor essence is not mediated by anything else, whereas the inessential is mediated. It may have a kind of given content, but that given content has been reduced to something that's mediated. It doesn't have an independent subsistence of its own. It's something that is, in a way, contained within the process of mediation. That we can speak of a distinction between the essential and the inessential is, has to do with the formality of the mediation. The mediation hasn't generated the content. But nevertheless, we're not dealing with a contrast of something and other. You know, essence is not a determinate being in that sense. But because the inessential, even if it has this, you could say, inherited content, is mediated by this other factor, essence, call it the positor or its determiner, it is something that is not a coeval or equiprimordial other, it is instead what Hegel identifies as shine, show, or illusory being. It's an illusory being because it's mediate. It doesn't have an independent subsistence. It is only through the determinant of essence. It's a determined determinacy. The determining of essence, however, has not taken on a character where it, it, it provides a principle for the specification of all the manifold content of what is mediated. But nevertheless, what is there that is mediated does not have any subsistence. It's a show. It's something that, as determined, is in relation to what it is not, but at the same time it is also mediated. It is positive. And so he, he moves from the contrast of the essential and the unessential to the relationship of essence to illusory being. But now we're, we're set for a further move, because illusory being, precisely because it is mediated, it is determinacy that is mediated, it is positiveness, as Hegel will put it. And he points out that in essence, determinate being takes the form of positiveness, because it is now no longer immediate, but mediated or determined by something else. As such, it reflects that it is determined by its determiner. 
right? the mere fact that it is determined, that it is mediated, which renders it a so-called show or illusory being, just as much makes manifest essence or the determiner. The determiner is reflected in what it mediates. Because as mediated or as an illusory being, it's an illusory being only in so far as it manifests the determining of essence or of its determiner. So the determiner in what it determines has itself reflected. Because it's determining, and it is the determiner, is something that is reflected in the determined. The determined is determined only in so far as it has its relation to the determiner. And on that basis, Hegel makes this move from the contrast of essence and illusory being to essence as reflection. Essence that reflects itself in what it posits. What it posits reflects the positor, the positing. Now the reflection to begin with, Hegel tells us, is takes a form of positing reflection. And what Hegel you know, indicates by this, you know, as, as you perhaps can see through the thicket of all the jargon, is that the positing or the determining that is reflected in the content of illusory being is a positing that merely renders that content mediated. Or another way of putting it, what is reflected in the content is the formal character that essence has at this stage. Because there's nothing about the positing of essence that actually generates the determinate content of illusory being. Illusory being reflects essence, but it reflects essence as just a positor without further qualification. For precisely this reason, essence's positing reflection turns out to be an external reflection, or what Hegel will also call a presupposing reflection. Because if essence is reflected as a merely formal positing, as, as a mediating, whose mediating does not generate the content of what, get, what is mediated, then the positing of essence has to take for granted what? What does it take for granted in being that kind of positing, that kind of formal positing, that formal mediating? It's all positive. Yeah, the content, the, ca the character of the positor. It, it, in a sense, has to presuppose that, because its mere mediating does not generate that. And yet, to be the, the mediator in that way of what is a show, it is a, 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 a reflection that, in some respect, presupposes that in which it is reflected, or is external to that in which it is reflected. That is. The illusory being the show is something that as show, as merely mediating, as not having any subsistence of its own, reflects the fact that it's determined, reflects essence in that regard. But because its content is, is sort of immediately present, even if it's just phenomenal, so to speak, the, the determining that it reflects is a determining that is, in some respect, external to or presupposes that manifold content. But in presupposing that manifold content, or shall we say, in being external to it, essence is no less, in a way, responsible for that content, because that content is not there independently of essence's determining, because it lacks any independent subsistence. Hegel therefore claims that reflection turns out to be a determining reflection. And he points out that determining reflection can be thought of as uniting positing reflection and presupposed and external reflection. It unites them because 
in some respect, the positing is going to posit what it presupposes. And in that regard, it's going to be determinative of what it posits. And it thereby becomes a determining reflection where precisely because that content uh, does not have an independent existence, the positing of essence is of such a character that it is responsible for that as well. And therefore, essence finds itself reflected as a determining reflection. <coughs> and this is going to then signify that the reflection of essence has become determinate. It's no longer this formal, empty uh, reflection in the sense that essence reflects itself as this formal positing, which only removes the immediate character of being in all its specifications. Now it is itself responsible for that. And in virtue of that, it has itself taken on a determinate character. And Hegel is then, under that heading, going to be speaking about a plurality of essentialities, as he puts it. After all, we're not just dealing with essence per se. If essence becomes determinate, you could say there are different types of essence here, different types of reflection. And this is something Hegel is going to address in the next session, next section. And interestingly enough, these different types of reflection are going to be characterized as identity, which is going to involve difference as it turns out. It's going to involve, secondly, opposition, and then thirdly, contradiction. And uh, that is what we'll attempt to, to think through next time. Uh, are there any questions on, on any of these terms <coughs> that I've sketched through very quickly? You have to look, look in the text. Uh, of mine, I'm, I, I go through this in a little bit more detail. Any questions about them? And, and how they sort of can be understood to engender one another? You know, as you, as you consider these, these different specifications in, in, in the logic of essence, keep in mind that what you're going to discover is that the character of what is positive, or the character of positiveness, or the character of mediated being, is going to itself undergo transformations. And those transformations are going to be connected to the determining taking on new, a new character as well. There's going to be a kind of linkage between the two, always. And I think part of understanding what's going on is to try to understand that, that kind of linkage. Well, well, I recommend take another look at, at these terms. Um, see if you can find some sense in the thicket of all of the uh, language. And uh, bring to class any questions you have about them. <coughs>